A few minutes real quick and give thanks and we'll go ahead and, and get started. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how thankful we are again to, to be able to gather together as friends and just enjoy the fellowship that your creation, your outdoors, and the fish that you've given us, Lord, that it's created the friendships and the fellowship and the support and the love we have for each other. We're thankful for this group and the men and women that are here and the men and women that can't be with us tonight. Lord, we just ask that you look after them. Um, we ask you to take care of those who are ill, our friend Duncan, um, those here who are recovering, some of those we may not even know who are ill. Lord, we just ask that you give them peace and comfort as they go through their sicknesses, Lord. We ask that you uh, put your arms around Mike and his father and as he comes up to a decision he has to make, Lord, we just ask that he leans on you and asks for guidance and peace and the decision he has to make with his dad, Lord. For all the men and the women and the families, Lord, that are part of our group and part of the fishing world, Lord, that, that are hurting, uh, maybe physical, maybe mental, maybe financial, maybe have issues with their family, Lord, we just ask that you reach out to them and let them know that they can lean on you, the true God, our eternal Savior, Lord. We're just so thankful for what you've given us. We just ask that you bring peace and have the people that need you, Lord, come to you and start to depend on you. We ask that you bless this meeting to your good, Lord. Keep everyone safe as you travel home. We ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Don't have what? I got it right here, brother. <laughs> All right. All right, tonight is not sexy. Speaker is, the subject's not. Uh, you know, and it's one of these things that, uh, you know, you always debate every year when you do one or two seminars like this, you're like, eh, is it really worth doing? Well, a situation happened a couple weeks ago. Uh, how many of you heard about the coiner that died in the fast tournament? Okay. We have a group of people here who are very connected in the fishing world, and it makes me really, really mad that not everybody's hand went up. I'm not mad at you guys. I'm mad at the rest of the media that covers fishing, because this should have been pasted all over every single fishing page ever developed. Anybody that ever talks about fishing, this should have been a big deal. And it's not. That's what pisses me off. And that's why I'm so adamant about doing tonight. So here's what happened. In a BFL tournament down in Okeechobee, Lake Okeechobee, Florida, a co-anger was thrown from the boat after his anger speared a wave. They were zipping across Lake Okeechobee. Now, I don't want to get into too much details that I don't know because I, that's not fair. So everything I know here is fact that I can prove that it happened. There were small craft advisories on the ocean about 35 miles from Lake Okeechobee. Now, Lake Okeechobee does not get weather warnings because it's an inland lake. It's a huge inland lake. If you ever look at a map, it covers up about a third of the lower third of Florida. It's a giant lake. The winds around the canals were six to seven, eight miles an hour. The wind in the middle of the lake was measured anywhere between 18 and 21 knots. That's a pretty good wind in a walleye boat, let alone a bass boat. Let alone a bass boat with a single console where your passenger is exposed to the weather and has no place to grab onto. That's another story for another day. So they're zipping across the lake right after takeoff. They figure about 7.35, 7.45 in the morning. Coanger is thrown from the boat. Jostles everybody around. Obviously, if you, if you spear a wave hard enough to throw somebody out of the boat, everybody is affected, right? Driver attempts to start the boat, can't get the boat started. We'll talk about why I think that happened in just a second. Driver went to the boat, went to the bow of the boat to deploy the trolling motor to go back and get his friend. And as he's in the process of deploying his trolling motor, he's wiped off the bow of the boat by another wave. As he goes in, he's able to grab the trolling motor, pull rope, attach it to himself. He drifts almost 20 miles across the lake. They find him after midnight that night. They don't know either one of these guys are missing until about 5.30 because we don't know until it's weigh-in. They don't check in for the weigh-in. Nobody sees them. You ask around the parking lot. Right, Chad, I was like, have you seen this guy? you seen that guy? No, nobody knows they're even missing. Okay. Co-anger is in the water. 
The driver again finds himself about almost not quite 20 miles across the lake, washes up on shore right around a little after midnight. Nobody knew they were missing until about 5 o'clock. The co body was recovered four days later. Okay? Right, so I want you to just think about that for a second. Just kind of digest all of that. All right, lots of things went wrong. Lots of things went wrong in a hurry. Lots of things went wrong that I guarantee you most of you in this room could not do right. That's why we're doing this tonight. We're not just going to talk about equipment. We're not just going to talk about equipping your boat. We're not just going to talk about having the stuff the Coast Guard says you have to have. We're going to talk about processes and procedures and things that went wrong so this never happens to anybody that pays attention. Okay? I did a radio show called Doc Talk Radio with a couple guys. Um, it absolutely blew my mind how nonchalant most people were. And that's, if you saw my answer today, Fairchild's very, very fair question about, you know, what does this mean just going to be about boat safety? Um, it absolutely is. Because there's too many people. You know, and, and this is, the, you want to, you don't want to, I don't want to get too fired up yet. Okay? There is talk on the BFL page, Facebook page, there are angers who in that tournament said, yeah, but 241 of us made it back. Oh, oh my God. That's a true story. Well, what can you do? It's not that big of a deal. 241 of us made it back. That's the attitude that causes this. Okay? And there's enough blame to go around. And when we did the radio show, I blamed a lot of people. I blame everybody in this room, because every one of us, me included, has been on a boat in situations we should not have been and not have been equipped for. I blame every single tournament organization that has sent guys on days they shouldn't go with the attitude, well, they're pros, they should be able to make a decision. Because you know what Andrew's going to do when he's got fish 40 miles away and you say, yeah, we're going? He's going to go 40 miles away, because we're not that smart. So every tournament organization, every tournament director is to blame for this guy dying. Every tournament angered at set lines that yeah, really shouldn't go, but everybody else is going. And still went, needs to be blamed. I believe every boat and motor manufacturer needs to be blamed, because someplace it's got to stop. 300, 350, what's next? Okay, what's next? And it's not that those are unsafe, not that those shouldn't be made, but there's too many people buying boats who don't know how to drive boats who are in boats they shouldn't be in. So I blame every single boat dealer that's ever sold a boat and gave you a safety package with four orange light jackets, a five pound anchor, 50 feet of rope, and a paddle. I blame every single boat salesman and boat dealer who sells a boat and does not take you to the lake and show you basic operation of a boat and test, drive a, and test ride a boat with you to make sure that you're able to handle this boat. I blame every single person that has a boat and is not taking a boater safety class. I don't care if you're 15 or 50. There's a lot of blame to go around. Okay? We all have to be responsible for what happens in our boat. And if we all get enough people responsible for what happens in their boat, and your friend's boat, and your friend's boat, and your friend's boat, and your friend's boat, and our group's boat, and everybody, next thing you know, hopefully that starts to spread. I can't fix the bass fishing attitude. I went out on a limb and said a lot of things on the radio show that are going to make me enemies in the bass fishing world, and I'm okay with that. I really don't care. One of those statements was, I believe that a boat with a single console should not be allowed unless you're in a team tournament. Unless Chad and I sign up and Chad goes, yep, Lance and I are fishing together. I know we only got a single console boat. I'm okay. When it's a blind draw tournament, and Jim Stewart signs up and goes, yeah, I'm going to fish the co or see what's going on. And he hops into a 22-foot bass boat with a 350-horsepower motor, and there's a single console, that should not be allowed. Because the boat captain, your responsibility is, first, the safety of your crew, second, the safety of your vessel, third, catching fish. Well, that's completely messed up. Especially in the tournament fishing world, okay? This did not have to happen. I truly believe that. I'm going to discuss this a little bit before we get into just kind of talking about what we need to do. 
What went wrong? Angos were wearing minimal, minimal PFDs. There's actually a picture of the guys going out. The co anger that passed away, his name is Nick Kaler. Nick, there's actually a picture of them. He has on a basic $20 Bass Pro Shops two buckle PFD. That's all he has on. That's all I have. That's all 9 amps other guys have on. If you look hard on some of the pictures, a guy sent me a picture the other day, you can actually, it's really about 90% sure that there's actually a rip in the corner of his life jacket and some of the foam is sticking out. Okay? Number one, that's a tournament, anger, or tournament organiz organizer's fault for letting them go out, right? A friend of mine said it well when we did Doc Talk Radio. A guy named John Miniacci, some of you guys know John. He said it well, two words cause this accident. Two words, bravado and greed. Bravado that I can go, I can do it. And greed that the tournament angler won't postpone a tournament for a day because he might lose some anglers. Let alone po postpone a tournament for two days of bad weather because man, I got expenses, I had to pull the trailer here, I got five hotel rooms, I got, not gonna, not gonna, not gonna cancel the tournament, we gotta keep those entry fees so we can pay. Bravado and greed caused this accident. I agree with John on that. Okay, the boat would not restart. I personally feel, this is, this is total speculation, and we're gonna get into this conversation in just a second. I believe if you hit a wave hard enough to throw somebody out of the boat, the driver probably was jostled enough that his kill switch came off. It's supposed to be attached. I'm gonna give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, I'm gonna give him the benefit of that doubt. Okay? So imagine you're driving across the lake, you spear away, boom, your boat goes over, your buddy goes out, you plop around, you want to get started to get back to him, your kill switch is undone, what happens? Click, 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 click. You're in panic mode, right? You probably don't think, okay, just a minute, is the kill switch on? I truly believe that was, I truly believe that that right there that and this, number two and number four, I believe that those two things are what caused the fatality. That's my personal opinion. Okay? <clears throat> number three, safety equipment to fix this was not instantly available. How many of you guys have a throw cushion in your boat? Okay? How many of you guys have an anchor in your boat? How many of you have a sea anchor in your boat? How many of you have flares in your boat? How many of you can get to them within 10 seconds? I'm pretty happy to see that. I guarantee you most people can't. Yeah, there's a throw cushion in here somewhere. Yeah, I got an anchor, it's down here. I never use it. Okay. Do you know that Michigan law, we looked this up as we were doing the radio interview, Michigan law does not require you to have an anchor on your boat? You can be completely legal in Michigan and not have an anchor on your boat. Is that the stupidest thing you've ever heard of? Think about that for a second. Okay? Safety equipment was not instantly available. I guarantee you, if you're in a bass boat, there ain't nothing. The guy was more worried about finding another pump, green pumpkin jig than he was worried about getting into safety equipment. And that's not a bass fishing thing, that's a fishing thing. Right? What's more important for you to grab when you're fishing every day? Your crankbaits or your... I'm never going to need that cushion. I know it's in here, so if I get stopped, I got it. Correct? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, so a guy goes over, a guy steps on the back deck and then a fish, he rolls over, you're going to throw him your box of crankbaits while you're digging out to get to your cushion? See where I'm going with this? Okay? I truly believe, again, my personal opinion, if this guy would have had an anchor, a throwable cushion, a drift sock, a power pole, he didn't have any power poles, believe it or not, I can't believe that happened. If he could have bought himself two minutes just to think, just to think, ah, nicks in the water, throw that sea anchor over, hook it up on the thing, get the boat turned into the wind, so at least now you're safe, get two seconds to think. Well, that's why I can't start the motor, the kill switches off. Problem is, everything happens so quick. And he made the worst mistake you can make when you're the only guy left in the boat. He did not stay with the boat. 
he would have been better to stay in that boat, drift away from his partner, make a phone call, right? Shoot up a flare, which I guarantee he didn't have. Okay? Get some help instead of trying to be a hero. Next thing you know, he's in the water. Now there's no chance for you to want him. So when you're out there by yourself, your responsibility is something that somebody goes in is to make sure you get more help before you start to help. Because the last thing you want to do is put yourself in the same position as your buddy. Now there's two guys in the water. Did they have a report on the wave height? Nobody will really say. Because if you got blown off the bow of a boat by a second wave. Yeah, well they, they were talking mid late 22. And in Okeechobee, imagine Houghton Lake on steroids. Imagine Houghton Lake 10 times bigger. That's Okeechobee. So you get 20 mile hour wind, those waves are big. And they're not just big, they're pointy. Right? And they're very aggressive. That's what they were in. Okay? And here's, I think, one of the worst ones nobody knew they were missing. Nobody had a clue they were missing. Guy goes in at 7.30, nobody knows till 5.30 they're even missing. Not even a hint that there's a problem. If they find him instantly, he's in the water for 10 hours. Okay? A lot of things went wrong. And I sure don't say that to blame anybody. It's a tragedy what happened. I'm sure the guy that was a driver feels terrible and he'll have to live with this every single day. I just want you guys to kind of look at the situation, look at what I think the factors were, and ask yourself honestly, are you ready to rescue somebody? Is your boat ready to get somebody back into it? Is your boat ready to let somebody know you need help? Is your boat ready to make sure your partner survives going in the water? Okay, that's why we're here tonight. I want to make sure when you leave here, you are. You guys saw this a couple years ago, but some really cool facts. Uh, we were down in Fort Wayne doing a show in Fort Wayne. We ran to a, a lady from the Ohio DNR who handles all, actually from the water division, handles all this stuff. And we went over the seminar, and she's like, oh, those are pretty darn close numbers. 70% 70 of, 70 of fatal boating accidents are drownings. Very few people get chopped up in the prop. Very few people. Most people drowned. Most people drown after they're in the water. Most people, three quarters of the people that die in boating accidents are in the water, conscious and not hurt. Three quarters of them drown. 85% of drowning victims are not wearing a PFD. That pisses me off. Some of you, rightly so, called me on my fishing pictures in Florida and said, you don't have a life jacket on. You're right, I didn't. Lance didn't have anything in the boat. There will be life jackets on his, well, he had those orange, what he has to have. There will be inflatable life jackets on his boat next year if I had to take my own and leave them with him. Some of you called me on that, rightly so. I expect you to. I'd be disappointed if you didn't. Not wearing a PFD. How many of you guys drive to where you're going to take your PFD out? Go, I'm just fishing. What's going to happen? Okay? I can't tell how many times every year I'm on the bow of the boat in Detroit River and I go to net a fish and a weight goes by, right? As I go down to net a fish, the boat goes back as I'm going down and you catch yourself, right? Everybody's seen, I think everybody's seen that river on the Columbia River, right? Three guys are fishing, just having a good old day. Guy got a boat, not paying attention, runs right over him. What did that have to do? What did the guys in that boat do wrong? Zero. One guy had a light jacket, one of the three had a light jacket on. That's why they're called accidents, guys. Okay? 71% of boating deaths occurred on boats where the operator had no boating safety instruction. Whereas only 15% of deaths occurred on vessels with training. Take a boating safety class. If you have not taken a boating safety class in the last eight to 10 years, take one. Greg's gonna tell you when he's got some time to actually squeeze you into one of his. If we 
we have to, I'll make one for us. We should make one for here. Okay? Listen to this. 82% of drownings were in vessels 21 feet or less. You know who's dying? Us. That's just drowning. Guys in boats like ours. Okay? Operator inattention and experience were the leading causes of watercraft accidents, while equipment failure was third. So the first, the top two leading issues with uh, deaths, inattention of the operator and inexperience of the operator. Sad part is, the only way you can learn to drive your boat in really crappy weather is to drive your boat in really crappy weather. That's one way you can get good at it. Okay? But there are some basics you can do, right? You know, when the, when the waves get really tough, you never take a wave straight head on or straight from the back, right? You have to learn how to, next time you're in rough water, it's a little bit rough. Learn how to get on top of a wave, ride the top of that wave, and let that wave push you down into the next trough. Then up on the next wave, and sometimes the fastest way to get back in is not a straight line. Sometimes you have to ride the troughs, ride the troughs, ride the troughs, right? But again, unfortunately, the only way you can get better at that is to be out in some pretty crappy weather. <laughs> okay, it's one of those catch-22s. April, October, November had the highest accident rates and the highest death rates. You know what that tells me? You know who's dying? Fishermen. Okay, because Johnny Party Boat ain't out in April. Okay. Over 50% of the accidents with deaths occurred while cruising or fishing. Again, we're the ones that are dying. It's us. Okay. 87% of under 12 year old deaths were not wearing a PFD even if they were required by law. You got a kid in your boat, 12, 13 years old, it gets PFD. I'll tell you what, it's just like you watch these guys now. You can't find it's very rare to find a guy in the NHL anymore that doesn't have a visor on. You know why? Because from the first day they start, they got a mask on. Right? We didn't have to wear them until we were in high school. Right? There was a bunch of ugly kids my age running around that played hockey. You can always tell who they were. Okay? Well, it was kind of annoying to put one on. These kids now, they grow up. Larry's got grandkids that are playing from the time they're four years old. They, get, they don't even let them go open skiing anymore without a helmet and a mask on. <laughs> right? Okay? If you teach your three-year-old, four-year-old, I know Chad's got a daughter that goes fishing with them all the time. You teach them that the boat does not leave until you get that PM. You know what they'll learn to do? Put that on. And in four or five years, they'll get on a boat with Uncle Joe and go, where's my life jacket? That's what you want. Just like wearing a seatbelt in the car. Okay? It's our responsibility to teach this to people. Uh, 2015, 4,158 deaths reported. 2,300 of those were in six inches or less waves. And 1,123 were in one to two foot waves. So 3,500 of that 4,200 were in waves less than two feet. It's not very waves killing guys. Not bad weather, okay? 3,100 of these 4,100 happened during the day with good visibility. So all this crap won't happen to me. I only fish inland. I know what, I know what I'm doing. I watch out. Well, guess what? The facts say the matter. 3,400 of that 4,200 in winds less than 14 miles an hour. It's not big wind, it's not big waves, it's not nasty weather that's killing us. It's going to net a fish and getting hit by a boat wave. And not having a PFD on. It's going to the back of the deck to net a walleye and not having a PFD on. It's somebody else driving a boat who doesn't know what they're doing. Hitting us. Okay? It's all those things that we have no control over. That's why it's called an accident. Okay? If you knew you'd have a planned collision at 2 o'clock, you'd be ready for it. It's not how it happens. Right? 
78% of the drownings were males. Bravado. That's profound. <laughs> right, because we're all idiots. I love this one. 40% of the males that were drowned had their pants down, open, or unzipped. Take a leak. That's why you carry a peach jug. That's exactly why you carry a peach jug. You kneel on the floor of the boat, you take a leak, you do whatever you want to do with it. I'm not going to tell you to dump it in the water, but easiest way to get rid of it. That's up there anyway. How many guys are the, how many, you know, again, bravado. How many guys are the guy in the back deck? <laughs> right? And there's no waves. It's the middle of the day. There's no wind. Why can't I stand up here and take a leak? Because that boat that just went by and caused a wake, while you were midstream and you weren't paying attention, hit the boat from the front, pop the boat up, pop the boat down, and you're in. <coughs> That's how it happens. All stuff we don't even think about. That's why I, this is a pretty cool slide. Okay? That Absolutely. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Those are pretty intense facts when you stop and look at it. We're not dying on crappy, windy days when we can't see. Make sense? Okay. Hopefully, some wheels are turning. Won't happen to me or I'm prepared, right? Do you have the PFD on? Good luck trying to get out of the water, especially if it's cold or you have lots of clothes on. I dare you. I absolutely 100% dare you. In the middle of July, hop in your pool with a pair of jeans, a sweatshirt on, a pair of shoes, throw a light jacket in. I dare you put a light jacket on. While you're in the water. Try it. Ain't gonna happen. Because you're doing what? You're trying to go, and the light jacket's trying to go. Good luck. You gotta add one thing to that, where they cannot touch. Where they cannot touch, thank you. I dare you to try it, I dare you to try it. You will fail. Flat out will fail. Okay? Your cell phone, you go in the water, your cell phone is now soaked, it won't work. Huh? Yeah, I, I don't even remember right I'm gonna call somebody. Yeah, okay. I don't know how that works for you. Okay? Say your boat, something happens to your boat, your marine radio is useless. The boat's upside down or you're in the water. How many of you are annoyed by your marine radio all the time? <coughs> fish over here, fish over here, so you turn it off. Right? Or you don't put your antenna up. Man, we're just going out here a couple miles. I don't need to talk to anybody. All of a sudden there's an accident, you gotta figure out how to get your antenna up with four rods and rod holders. <laughs> right? And get it turned on. It's called an accident, guys. You need to be ready right now. Can't use your flares because they're in a compartment so they're out of the way. I saw a guy last year, I said, you got flares in your boat? Just kind of, you know, being nice. Yeah, pulls them out, digs in his glove box, pulls them out, they're still in the nylon pad and the plastic packaging that came in. That's awesome. Well, you just drowned while you were trying to find your flares. Or worse yet, you go. And here's why I want you to think about all this, guys. And this is why I do a lot of things I do different than I did a couple years ago. What if you go in? What if you go in? You got some guy in the boat who's never in the glove box. I don't see any glove box. Get the flare. What's the flare? Right? Number one reason I don't allow alcohol in my boat. I don't want some drunk idiots to have to save my life. Think about it. Right? You and a buddy take a case of beer out fishing. You're three hours into the day. Right? You're having a good old time, six, seven beers. 
Kind of good old time, something happens, you go in, or worse yet, have a medical emergency. Do you want that guy to be the guy you depend on to save your life? 100% why I don't allow alcohol in my boat. Because you may be my only chance to survive. Not approved. Trust me, right? In a boat, on the water, there's no place to screw around. It's no place to tempt fate. It's no place to put yourself at bigger risk than you already are. I'll tell you how fast this happens. I don't know if Chad's ever had this happen. I have had a live well intake break off. Okay? Did you have that? Right? Everything's perfect. Drive across the lake, hit a you know, sit down the fish, ass end goes boom. Because the cable or the, the hose between the back end of the boat and the pickup and the pump came undone. Nothing I it just hose broke. Now there's raw water rushing into my boat faster than I can get it out. My fault? I didn't do anything. Or but winter time you freeze this. Winter time, pump freezes, pump housing cracks, you don't know it. Three or four trips into the spring, you turn your live ball pump on, here comes all that water. Your handheld marine radio is floating somewhere. You can't find it. The batteries are old, haven't been charged. Right? That's one of the reasons I think that handheld marine radios, other than a backup, are a bad idea. If you're going to spend any time at all in the water, you need to have a fixed mount, 25 watt, 8 foot antenna. You can do it for 300 bucks, do it. Those handheld ones talk from about here to that back wall if they're fully charged, which they never are. Okay, that handheld is strictly for an emergency, correct? I don't think anybody here has not seen somebody put a bow without, without a plug. That's funny, <laughs> right? Until, right? So, first thing we did, one of the things we did, because that crest liner had, in the same plug you guys got in your Ranger, that little plastic has to screw in from the back. Okay? Took that off immediately. First thing we did when we got the boat back to free, I took that off and put the actual tube in. You know, the actual tube with the regular. Now, I put my plug in from the outside, so I, and I take my plug out. As soon as the boat's on the trailer and off, I take it off, and the plug does not go back in until I launch. But I also have a plug on the inside of the boat, because you cannot get down to your plug from the inside of your boat. Can't, ain't gonna happen. So I also keep a plug on the inside so if I do have a problem, I can open up my storage compartment, my access hatch to the back, and put that plug in through the back. Okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's another thing I do is I always keep a spare plug on the boat. I have three or few I've ever been in my boat. There's four or five plugs flop around the splash wall all the time. I just leave them in the splash wall. And I've got one in the back on a rope that stays right towards the back of the boat. So it's not when I go back there to get it, it hangs right by the hole and I can get it into the back and I can plug the hole. Just stuff to think about. Okay. okay. Your float cushion is still on the boat because it's in a compartment, so it's out of the way. Come on, how many of you guys have your stuff put in a storage compartment? Okay. The boat goes by. Say it's dusk, right? Early morning, late afternoon. The boat goes by. You're in the water. You have no way to get a hold of them. No way to signal, right? Because you're in the water. No one knows you're gone, or no one knows you're late coming home. That's happening to these guys now. Is what it is, right? But even when I was tournament fishing, I always had a group of guys that, would be, you know, hey, I'm going to end up fishing over here between, you know, one thirty, two o'clock. So all of a sudden you don't show up, right? At least they're thinking a little bit. Where's he at, right? There's no one in the boat that can operate it safely or use the radio and GPS. I guarantee you, 99% of you have that happen 99% of the time. Think about before you leave the dock. If you stop right now, if you could not do anything, are the people in your boat equipped to save your life? Forget about saving their life. Are the people in the boat equipped to save your life? That's what you need to start thinking about. Not can I save theirs, can they save mine? And if you have those procedures in place for the guy who goes fishing with you once a year, 
I guarantee your procedures are good. Okay? This is my big one. You can't get back in the boat. Again, I will challenge you. Pair of jeans, pair of boots, shirt, sweatshirt, challenge you to get back in your boat. Can't do it. Now add an hour and a half in the water. Now add you bonked your head. Now add you hurt your shoulder going over. 50 degree water. We were talking about this. This actually happened. The guy actually was missing when I was up at the National Professional Anglers Association Conference in Minnesota and I was talking to one of the guys, that's a friend of John Gilman's, we were talking about this. And this is a big guy. This is a guy who is early 30s, in shape, doesn't look like any of us, right? In shape, big guy, strong guy. He says, you know, he goes, I was in the water for 21 minutes. 65 degree water. He's, I could not lift my leg high enough to get onto the ladder to get in the boat. And this is not an old fat guy. This is a young, strong guy. So I could not lift my leg with all its clothes on, all wet. Could not lift my leg high enough to get onto the ladder to get into the boat. Think about that when you tell me you got a ladder with one step. And that step barely goes under the surface of the water. You don't have a ladder. Okay? Just be prepared. All right? Smart things to do. Always wear a PFD and demand everyone else in the boat does too. Pretty simple. The boat should not leave until the PFDs are on. Should not come off until the boat is docked, tied up on the trailer. That's a decision you have to make. If you want to be responsible, that's the decision I think you have to make instantly. And you just tell everybody that's just the way it is. If you don't like it, don't go. Okay. After this happened, I have made a decision that the only place I'm going to be a touch lax on this will be in the pontoon while we're fishing. I will encourage everybody in the pontoon to put their PFDs on and leave them on. I will allow you to take your PFD off when we stop and fish in the pontoon because we're dealing with rails this high. Not saying it can't happen. Okay, this year I didn't even think about life jackets being worn. This year that will be required. I don't care if it's 97 degrees out in Saginaw Bay. Before I leave that dock, I really have a PFD on when that big motor's running. Okay? And I definitely do it in my other boat. There's not a question in my other boat. Your PFD should have reflective tape, a sailing device, and a light source. I don't mean the little white, the little reflective strip out here when it's closed. If you're using the automatics, I mean something on the yellow. So when you go in and it poofs up, and you've got a yellow light jacket, you need to buy some reflective tape. You can buy it in little four by four inch squares and slap a couple pieces on the yellow part. So if it does inflate, people can see it. Okay? They're talking about five to six miles from a plane with reflective tape, where you can sometimes get down below a half mile without reflective tape. Huge difference. Okay? Whistle, light source. We'll talk about how break your life jacket in just a second. Have a way for your safety gear to get in the water with you. Don't store it in a compartment. Craig was nice enough to bring his ditch bag. We'll talk about that a little bit later tonight. File a float plan with somebody who is a pain in the butt. And what I mean by that, someone who's going to call you at 301 if you haven't called them at 3. Our float plans are awesome. I love it. Okay? But not everybody watches it. Okay? That's a secondary thing. And I think our float plans are more for, hey, I'm going to be here if you want to Join me, join me. Not that we don't watch them. And, you know, I sent an email to, actually a wife sent me an email and said, hey, my husband's not back and we got a hold of him through Facebook and he said, no, I'm still okay. And she appreciated that, right? So I think find a full plan on our Facebook page is a great idea, but you need to file with somebody else, somebody who's not there. Somebody's going to be a pain in the butt if you're not calling by 301. 
First thing I do when my boat hits the dock of Detroit River, I send my wife and my father a text. In, that's all it says. In, done. How long does that take? In. Okay, doesn't take very long. File full plan with somebody who's an absolute pain in the butt. That says three and three hundred one. They're calling you. On your challenges, I would add that it's almost impossible to lift somebody into your boat oh. if they are not capable of really helping themselves. How many of you think you can lift me into a boat? <laughs> you okay. You don't have to be big. I'm okay. They can't help. They can't help. Right. Yeah, I, cha I challenge anybody here to lift Josh into a boat. Oh, absolutely. In two foot waves, especially if he's unconscious. Yeah. He doesn't have a life jacket on. Yeah, won't happen. Better have, better have something that you can lift. Lift something in one of the wooden waves. Exactly. That's so much different than And you have no leverage. Because that person is below you, right? You can't use your legs. It's all arms and back. You can't, you can't do it. You just you can't do it. Okay, have a ladder on the boat. We'll talk about that in a second. Train others to run the boat, use a radio rhythm. I'll tell you, nothing makes me more upset when somebody's a boat owner and won't teach somebody how to back their boat and how to drive their boat. That's what drives me. I want to take them right out of the car at the boat ramp and punch them right in the throat. Okay? Don't be so bravado. Don't be so proud that you can't have somebody help you. Someone's going to go fish with you more than once, you can teach them how to back the boat up. We're like I learned. Go to a freaking movie cinema parking lot in the middle of the afternoon, put a couple cones out, and learn to back the boat. That's how I learned how to back a trailer up. School parking lot. Whatever, find a big parking lot and go. Or teach them how to drive your boat. Number one, you don't tie up the ramp with the, you don't tie up the ramp. Because that's my number one pet peeve with the ramp. Right? Guy backs the boat in, he gets out, pushes his boat out, he ties his boat up, while the other guy stand there, he drives his truck and parks it, and then comes back and takes the boat away. Meanwhile, 15 people could have launched if somebody could have drove that boat away from the dock. Three more people could have launched, he could have come back up and got his guys and been done. Okay? It's a courtesy thing, number one. Number two, what happens if something happens? If you have somebody in your boat that you don't trust to drive it away from the dock, and drive it back to pick you up, what's going to happen if you're in the boat and have a heart attack? Does it make sense? I don't think it's groundbreaking, right? Have emergency plans printed and showing on the boat. Something we have to do as charter cabins, you should do that too. You should have a plan step-by-step, step, man overboard, what happens? Step-by-step, step, captain's disabled, what happens? Step-by-step, step, what to do in this? Get them done, front and back, laminate them, stick them in your windshield. Because when panic starts to happen, the person you just talked to who doesn't do it every day ain't gonna remember, give them something to look at. Step one, do this. And think about every little thing you have to do. And have it written big enough you can see it. Have it written big enough that people can see it. Absolutely. All right. Okay? All right. Let's talk a little bit about PFDs. Obviously, you have to have these on. I, I, we're not going to have that fight anymore. Um, they become so comfortable and so easy to wear, right? Um, these are the ones that we wear on our boat. Are they perfect? Probably not. Uh, are they better than wearing nothing? Without question. Exponentially better than wearing nothing. Okay? This type right here is, um, you're required by law to have a type 3 life jacket in your boat for everybody on board. Okay? A type 3. This style here with an indicator where you can actually see that you're charged or not is a type 3. Actually counts even if it's not on. Which defeats purpose. We're not going to talk about that. This is a type five, which has to be on to count as a type three. So if you have these in your boat and the people aren't wearing them, you're not legal. 
So I would tell you, buy these and tell everybody, eh, you gotta wear it. You got no choice. Why don't you have to wear the other one? Because you can, they can tell that it's charged and it'll actually work. I have no clue. It's stupid. But well, is what it is. I, I don't make the rules, I just pretty well follow them. Lance, yeah? do those <clears throat> cylinders in the, the red and the black, yep. do they expire? They do expire, three years. There's actually expiration dates on them, yeah. Before, before, I yeah. Find an expiration dates. I yeah. last year. There should be an expiration date on your bobbin that goes in. There'll be a printed date on that, and there should be one on your cylinder, too. That's you have to get rid of the same way. What's that? Disposing them? I, I'm sure there is a way to dispose of them. Yeah, <laughs> mine with the trash. So I'm sure somewhere something will blow up someday. From uh, I change mine every spring. Before I go to Detroit River, I put new bobbins and new cartridges every where spring. You, where do you get them at? We carry them. Okay. Yeah. yeah, we carry them. What's the difference between automatic manual and automatic? They both have the manual pull, right? Correct. Yeah, they all they all have the manual pull. I think this is a is a distinguisher that you don't have the ability to see that it's armed. Okay, because they both work exactly the same. The mechanism is exactly you look at the, the mechanism is exactly the same. Greg, do you know? When they first came out, we have a red handle, we have the all handle, we all handle states the automatic or manual. Right. The red manual is only manual. Okay. Okay, so the real if I were to you know, stop somebody that had the red handles and they're not wearing them, sorry, you didn't take it. Okay. Uh, they have them with the yellow handle. That's one thing when they hold them up, I look for the handles. Gotcha. Okay, so the red, the yellow handle tells you, yes, it's an automatic for sure. The red handle tells you it has to be pulled. Now, that's not true because this is an automatic inflate. When they first came out there, yeah. well, they, they, still, they still do make a manual, though. They, they make an M24 and an M32 that you actually physically have to pull to get, get to activate. Okay, I would tell you to make sure whatever you buy has an A on it, that's an automatic. You go in, you bonk your head, you're good. Okay, and this number here is the poundage of the flotation. I want right? to also say, do any life jacket that has any tear, if it's a quarter can. inch, the hook, yep. it's still good anymore. And if you have any boat, it doesn't count. Okay, so they have to be in good repair, they have to be able to function. Yeah? If you're, uh, if you're wearable all the time, is there a difference between the two? I don't know. I don't notice the difference between the two at all. I mean, I, it, I, I'll tell you what's funny is I get guys on the boat, oh, I'm not going to be able to get there. No, you're going to wear them or I'm not going to go. That's, you know, pretty simple. And they put them on, yeah, I put them on, I never wear that, that, that. And then they get out of the boat at the end of the day and they walk away and go, hey, can I have my life jacket back? Oh, I forgot to hit it on. <laughs> right? The guys who complain the most are the guys who forget they're there. Right? I mean, the, how many guys have these? Should be a lot of our guys, right? Extremely comfortable, easy to fish in. You know, they're, they're simple. It was funny, I was talking to the guy who runs the bass tank, um, the hawk trough, right, that comes to the show, this guy named Jim Vitaro. Great guy, eternal bass fisherman. I got to know him the last couple of years, so we had a lot of downtime at Fort Wayne. <laughs> so we're talking, and we got talking about this guy going in, and I kind of voiced my opinion, and Jim is a tournament bass fisherman. He's, well, you, know, you can't do that, you can't do Oh, here we go again, right? Oh, 221 guys made it back. So we got talking about this, and Dean had a great line. He's like, I said, you know, why don't guys wear these? You know, if, if the BASS guys and the FLW pros put these on and got on the front deck, number one, they never know they had them. And how many guys would start wearing them? He goes, yeah, he goes, they cover up my logos. <laughs> And Dean said, that's good. On the back of your shirt, we'll put this death sponsored by Ranger. <laughs> thought awesome. Nice thought awesome. Right? I mean, but that's how these idiots think. Right? And it's not just the bass guys, you know. But could you imagine if for one year all the BASS guys and all the FLW guys we see on TV had these on? How many more recreational angles would wear them? Logos on, I know. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can put a logo. Yeah, you can. But that's the kind of stuff that people, right? I can't wear it because, right? Everybody's got a reason, and that's why I did this. Keep them in good shape. Great, made a great point. They don't work if they aren't on. And again, you're not. It's impossible to put on when you're in the water. Accidents happen while fishing as well as when you're underway. 
don't get a false sense of security just because you're in four feet of water pitching jigs to a dock or you know casting to a wheat bed for a walleye. Don't get sleepy. Don't get sucked in that you're safe. Have important items attached, right? And these are the kind of things we're talking about. You can buy this reflective tape in um, four by four inch squares. I think you get four squares in a pack for about eight bucks. Okay, slap it on the yellow part of your life jacket. Some kind of light source. This is a battery operator that we have to have on our type one light jackets uh, for charter captains. I would tell you for a recreational anchor, this is better than this. Oh, this one is better. So this is a light, this is battery operated, but you don't have this batteries, right? They don't work. So all my light jackets have silent light sticks on them. Batteries never go dead on those. But you have to crack those in half, don't you? Yeah, you get in the water, you crack them open, away you go. But you still got to turn this light on too, so if you're not, if you're not conscious, you ain't, neither one's working. Right. Unless you want to spend 60 bucks for a water activated light, you can't get those. Batteries dead, batteries dead. Batteries dead, batteries dead. <laughs> what about the dye pack? <laughs> the dye packs only are, the, the only reason you ever want to, dye packs aren't a bad idea, but the only time you ever want to activate a dye pack is when you knew somebody was there to find you. Because by the time you activate a dye pack and somebody comes three hours later, that dye's all gone. That dye pack is a, hey, there's somebody, I need to let them know I'm here. Right? That's what that's for. Um, a signal mirror. And I would tell you, minimum, a whistle and a light source. I can't imagine anything worse than being in the water for a couple hours, watching a boat go by, and not having any way to get a hold of them. I can't imagine any more sinking feeling than going, I'm rescued, there they go. And not being able to blow a whistle or shine a light. Okay? <laughs> and since this happened, uh, I am getting much more excited and adamant. I would tell you, every single guy in here, because they are not that expensive, you need to have at least one of these in your boat. I would tell you, if you want to do this right, every single one of your life jackets has one of these on it. These are personal location beacons. We're selling, I don't know if you saw the post, I posted 15 times, but I got so upset at the end of the radio program about this, that until the end of February, we are selling all of our safety items at my cost. Through the website. Life jackets. Light sticks, whistles, personal location beacons, lights. And then I saw on my site, I'm selling at my cost until the end of February. You have no excuse to not have this stuff. Zero. And if you do it right, you can pack this rescue link plus inside your inflatable light jacket. It's the size of a cell phone, about twice as thick. I got one in the truck. Yeah, you have the brake, yeah. Okay? So just stuff to make sure. At minimum, put a light stick and put a whistle on your light jacket. Opens up. What I do is I tape it to the blow-up tube. All right? I stick it over the blow-up tube. I just, you know, knot it. Then I just put a piece of tape over it. So it stays there. Now when that pops open, the whistle floats up, the light floats up. I don't need right there. Okay? Craig? What's that? Yeah, there you go. So Craig's got a. It's, it's a, it's a water activated, water activated, and manual, so you can turn around. And there you go. So it's got a strobe on it. Put it in your cup. Oh, it actually, it actually, it actually, it actually, it actually, I love the fact you're, I, I love it. I, I'm glad somebody's ready to roll. Other stuff, right? We'll talk about anchoring a rope in a minute. This is huge, guys. There's places you can buy these. Um, I carry about 12 cheap ones that you can buy at um, Menards, and then I carry four good ones that I bought at West Marine. And basically what they are is they're heavy-duty bungee cords with carabiner clips. Okay? I have one attached to my water light. This is, this is something we have to have as a charter captain. We have to have a water light that once it gets submerged, it pops out of the bracket automatically. It's weighted, it floats up. This starts to strobe as soon as it goes upside down. But what good is that when I'm here, it's 300 yards that way. So I have a four foot long bungee cord with a carabiner strap. Something happens, the first thing I do is I take that strap, I hook it to my light jacket. Or a belt loop. 
Okay? These are awesome for quickly deploying drift socks. Right? Your drift sock, your sea anchor, you should have one drift sock committed to being a sea anchor. It should be the heaviest one you have, not a cheap nylon. It should be a nice, heavy canvas thing, and you should have a heavy-duty 8 to 12, 10 foot either rope on it with a carabiner clip on the end or one of those bungee cords. Something you can real quickly throw that bag out, clip it to a cleat, and you're done. Now you can go on taking care of the rescue. You shouldn't have to pull, okay, I got a bag. I got some rope in here somewhere. Should be instant. Your sea anchor should be ready to roll. Some kind of throw cushion. We have to have a 20 inch life ring. Okay? And I carry uh, a 50 foot rope with a, with a clip on both ends that I can that I keep right next to my um, buoy that I can clip on. If I want to use my buoy, I can clip onto that, throw the buoy out, and be able to get it back and throw it back out if I have to. This is cool. This is called a throw bag. This has 50 feet of rope in it. You basically open the rope, pull the end out here, grab this. You can actually throw that as opposed to trying to throw somebody a rope. So you're throwing the bulk of the rope. You actually have something you can actually throw. I know guys that take rubber balls about the size of a softball. They drill through them, run a rope through it, put a washer on it, tie a knot, and now when they go, Dan's in trouble, I gotta get him a rope, and I can take that ball and throw that ball with Dan. I'm not trying to throw a 50 foot rope that goes nowhere. Okay, so having a ball ready to go or having that throw bag where you have some mass that you can actually throw. And as you throw that bag, the rope comes out, you can actually throw it. Okay? Throw bags are weighted, yeah. One thing I'd recommend too on the throw bags, take like a little six feet piece of parachute cord, tie it on the bottom and then tie that to your cleat. If you throw it too damn far, you, lose you still got it. You lose the whole thing, you still yep. got it. Another, you know, there's a PLB again. This is an EPER. Okay? This is actually, a PLB is a personal locator beacon that's designed to be on your person. An EPER is designed to be with the boat. They both work exactly the same way. Once they're activated, they send a signal up, 406 megahertz up, that activates the rescue satellites, and they receive and transmit on 121.5, which is the surface vessel frequency. So once you go in the water and you activate either this, and most of the EPIRBs are automatically activated, so once they get in the water, they start to activate. Right? Most of the personal location beacons are one push or two push. Turn it on, send the signal. Once you do that, this happens and does not stop for about 30 hours until the battery goes dead. Do you imagine what happened if the gentleman that went out of the boat would have one of those on his life jacket? He'd have a funny story to tell. Yeah. Jimmy? Is it the water pressure that activates them? In other words, when it rains, it gets wet and doesn't activate. Does not activate. No. So it's water pressure. Correct. Activated. Yep. These these come on a breakaway mount. That once they get enough that they start to flow, they break away from the bracket and they automatically go. If you ever watched Stink, you know Deadliest Catch, right? You've heard them talk about knee perp going off. And if you watch, you can see they've got big ones. I mean, theirs are in cases those big gray cases on the bulkhead that are about yay big, yay wide. Those are perps. And once the water gets up, it opens the case and shoots the EPIRB out and they get an automatic signal. Okay? But the PLBs can go right in your life jacket, right in your ditch bag, right? And they make it easy for you to, I'm in trouble. You, guys, you can take these hiking, right? You're going to spend your time in the woods, you're going to go camping, you're going to go hunting back in the backwoods. These, take these with you. Something happens, it goes up to these satellites and sends a signal. Okay? They work a lot of places phones don't, absolutely correct. Ditch bag or a box, right? This is something I, you know, I don't know what Craig, Billy? If you fall out of a tree. If you fall out of a tree. Why would you do that? Why are you climbing a tree without safety harness? I don't climb a tree at all. Okay. You can fall all the way up the tree. Yeah. Not if you have a climbing harness. To kill a freaking deer, you guys are idiots. Craig? Exactly. I agree with you. Well, there you go. There you go. 
All right, so some things to have in your ditch bag. Um, a prepaid cell phone, okay? I am not as, I have one of these ready to go. It's actually in this box right here. And I gotta be 100% honest with you, I don't carry with me all the time. That's a sad thing to say, that will stop after tonight. Um, but I have a prepaid cell phone. You can get a prepaid cell phone for 40 bucks with 50 minutes. Turn it off, leave it in there. Now if something happens, your phone doesn't come with you or gets wet or you've still got something, then maybe you can make a phone call when you get somewhere. I keep three, this is what I do with my expired flares. I keep three flares in there. Great place to put your expired flares. Portable GPS, I have a portable GPS. I have a handheld GPS in mine. I will have a PLB in there now. Um, oh, flares twice, there you go. A whistle, a light source, I carry a couple silent sticks. I have a little hummingbird handheld VHF radio that I carry in my box. Extra batteries. This is really cool. The reason I use this old hummingbird, and it's old, it's probably 20 years old, it works on four AA batteries. So I don't have to have goofy batteries, right? So I can go to the store, I got eight AA batteries and a little waterproof box that goes in here. I can now power up my VHF radio. Don't ever count for your safety on a radio that has to be recharged or works on one of them goofy batteries you can only buy somewhere, okay? There are some radios on the market, handhelds, that still work on AA batteries. Extra batteries, I carry a hat and gloves. So I'll tell you what, guys, you're in the water for an hour, two hours, I don't care if the water's 70 degrees, you're gonna get cold. Anybody here been in the water for a while? Not on purpose? You been in the water? You get cold, don't you? Doesn't matter how warm, you start to lose, and where do you lose your heat from? You start to lose your heat from your extremities, right? Your head and your hands. Okay, stay warm. I carry a couple protein bars and I carry a bottle of water in there, just in case. And again, when I had this in the boat, I'm mad at myself, but I'm telling you the truth. When I had this in the boat, I have one of those carabiner, four foot carabiner clips on it. So if I do go in, I instantly can grab that, hook it to my belt, hook it to my life jacket, and I have it with me. Craig, you got a way to secure your bag to you? Uh, yeah, and the straps actually are. On the bag, so you pull one of these clips and you put the straps in your bag. There you go. Each other to you. And if you've got any uh, ropes or tape or carabiners or whatever, you can put them out of the bag. How many guys have a ditch bag? The, the boating safety class guy and one other guy. I'll say, I just, I just, I'm fired. I, I just got this. Okay, good. All right. I think that's awesome. And, you know, I mean, you can buy a dry, you can buy a big, this is an dry bag. I put all of my rain gear in. You can buy a bag like that at Cabela's for 20 bucks. One of those dry bags, all right? Just put stuff in there, put it in heavy duty Ziploc baggies so everything doesn't get wet. You can at least keep it from getting nasty. Stick it in your boat. And the Ziploc bag will hold 15 pounds of gear and still float. So it floats. So now it's a flotation device. Now it's a flotation device too, right? All right, some stuff for your boat. Always make sure you have an anchor and a rope. We'll talk about that in a second. A sea anchor, again, Drift socks work, but drift socks traditionally are very, very light material. Sea anchors are traditionally heavier material. That's kind of the distinction, right? That's why if you see the stuff that I use, most of the stuff that I use is, I went to the Amish Outfitter bags, because now they'll work for trolling bags, they'll work for drift socks, and if I get in trouble, I can pitch more. Flares, you know, some, again, the, we talked about these carabiners. Um, this is an option, I'm gonna talk about this option in just a second, okay? Uh, make sure you got a big enough anchor. There's not a single guy in here. I know what most of you have for boats. There's not a single guy in here that shouldn't have a 20, 25, 30 pound anchor in your boat. Not a single one of you can anchor your boat with a 15 pound anchor. Ain't gonna happen. Okay, you need to be up 20, 25, 27 pounds. Three to four foot of chain attached. That's huge. That gets the anchor the rope pulling the anchor down instead of up, because most rope we're going to use is going to float. So you want that pull to be down instead of up. The more you can get that anchor to dig, the better it's going to dig and the better it's going to hold. So three to four foot of chain. And then I would tell you a minimum of 100 feet rope. Most of you, because of where we fish, need about 200, maybe an extra 100 shot in your boat. Chain is also for abrasion resistance. Chain is definitely for abrasion resistance. 
Okay, I carry 300 foot shots in my boat. One is attached to my anchor. At the end of that is a, um, a what do they call that? You, a D ring. The little ring you put in there. You know, automatically yeah, do that. Right. Yeah, the little ring. It's the, the metal eye. It's the metal eye thing that goes in there. Shackle. Shackle. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> and then on the end of that is actually one of the screw things, right? Then my next shot of rope has one of those at each end, so I need to attach it to simply together, and they go. And if I need 300 feet, the 200 feet goes, and the extra 100 has a screw on it. So I got 300 feet of rope ready to roll. 100 feet instantly. And I carry a big rope. My rope is big, and it's big for a reason. The bigger the rope is, the less chance it has of being knotted when you throw it over. You start carrying that 3 8 inch nylon rope that the boat dealer gives you, right? Put it in your compartment, throw the anchor over, about six feet go out, and you got a ball this big. That's really good. And you'll lose the anchor. <laughs> Poof. Okay? Just be prepared. I have a drift sock ready to go with a eight foot carabiner bungee cord, heavy duty bungee cord, the heavy duty ones you can get at West Marine, hooked on one end, ready to roll. Instantly get in the water. Right now, get in the water, hook it to a cleat. Okay? Because I guarantee you that guy that drowned, the, the poor bass guy, if he could have got a sea anchor out and got his boat turned into the wind, he would have bought himself at two minutes. Because what happened, I guarantee you, is his boat got in the trough, he would have to pull his trolling motor, Right? And he got rocked and away he goes. If he could have got that boat turned around with a sea anchor, got the nose into the wind, he probably could have got his motor deployed. Because now the boat's only going like this. I guarantee you, if he were to pull his motor as he went to pull, the boat went. Okay? So long enough rope, big enough rope, enough for the area you're fishing, minimum 100 feet. Sea anchor, keep the boat in the wind, flare, signal for help, bungee cords, the clip, easy. Okay, I want to talk about this for a second. This now does meet U.S. Coast Guard requirements, but I have a couple issues with this over regular flares. I would tell you it's an option as a secondary device. It should not be your only signaling device in the boat. Biggest problem I have, works on batteries. When the batteries go bad, when you need them or when you don't need them, <laughs> right? Okay. The other problem I have is, and I don't know what the law is because the law says you have to have at least three sealing devices. So you have to have at least three flares in your boat. Okay. You have to have at least three flares, daytime, nighttime, but at least three day and night signals, right? And a flare counts for both day and night. I'm not sure the Coast Guard is going to let you get away with one of those. So you may have to, I don't know, I don't know that for a fact. I will do some more checking. I'm not so sure you're not going to have to have three of those. So now are they really more cost effective? Right? And the problem with one device is you have one device. What if it fails? Right? You got your three flares in your boat that are good, that aren't expired. And I hope you got your last set of expired flares in your boat also. Now you got six. You got six chances. Or you got three guys in the boat, you can hand everybody a flare. If you get separated. That gives you one chance. Not a bad backup. I wouldn't count it as my only signaling device. That's just me personally. Okay? There are times when just manual crap that's been around forever works a whole lot better than automatic stuff. I believe that a lot. Okay? Let's talk about ladders real quick. Oh my goodness gracious. Wait, Have, yeah. Now that signals the SOS, right? So at night you'd see a flare that's going to be the SOS. Now at night. I don't know. I don't know that for a fact. I didn't do enough research into this because I looked at it and my first thought was, not crap, just one device as opposed to multiples. That was my first, right? In an emergency, you want to have more than one chance to save your life, okay? But what I read is that uh, it flashes the SOS. Okay. And my thinking is at night, if I'm running along, I see a Absolutely. light flash over there. I, Absolutely. Uh, I, I have a last little bird 
Yeah, I would tell you, I'm not telling you it's a bad idea. I'm just telling you I wouldn't use it as my only device to signal people. How many guys truly know what the SOS looks like? <laughs> One out of a hundred. Yeah, so, well, have, the, have the guy, 90% of the people on the water don't know a green buoy from a red buoy. You think they're going to know, you know? And if you're in the waves, if I right. flash your head down on the like Correct. Yeah. In all the waves. So, Dean? Right. No, I was just going to say I like the flares over that because, I mean, the flare, you can launch it. It, yeah, not the handheld flare, but yeah, if you have a launcher, right? I mean, if you have a launcher, you can't go on Canadian. Launcher. Yes, you can. If you launch, you, yes, you can go. You can you can take a launcher into Canada as long as all you have in the boat are the shells that are actually pyrotechnics for launching. Even the pistol frame, even the pistol frame, as long as all you have in the boat are. And not shot in the chest. Yeah. yeah. Everybody okay with that? So a good option, but I wouldn't count on my. This is something I would probably put in my ditch bag. More than on my boat. And change the batteries. I would tell you, I don't know if that's a you know one of those lifetime, a hundred year lithium. Just, you know. just three years, but they recommend you change it every season. They don't fish in November. That's part of it. <laughs> All right, ladders. This is huge, guys. Um, this is a no right here. No, no, and I would tell you my personal opinion, no. That's just my personal opinion. Okay? If you've ever tried one of these, it's a wet noodle. Good luck. All right? Again, not deep enough in the water. Right? In this situation, I don't want anybody to have to come in the boat close to the prod. And if I hear one more guy say, well, you just step on the cavitation plate and turn the motor, I'm going to punch him in the nose. And that's just stupid. <laughs> I, I, watched a fr I watched a friend swimming during pre-fishing turn because it was 100 degrees outside, hop into a lake, go to put his foot up on the cavitation plate, slip, and put a six inch deep gash across his thigh. That's great for your day. Okay, Get a ladder that extends far enough in the water, I would tell you at least two feet, Below the surface. Okay. I actually have a swim platform on the back of my boat. I did that on purpose. Do a full swim platform with a four-step retractable ladder. Okay. Even I can get back in my boat. Okay. If I want, but I'm just telling you, I can get back in my boat. Josh? I will say one thing about telescoping ladders for somebody who's using a work at a marina. <coughs> those things will fall, like, they have some weight to them, they will fall over and they could potentially hit you in the head. I have to hit the head with those and it hurts. So, yeah, it hurts and it starts. I like, th this, this is probably my favorite idea if you're worried about, you know, oh, it came in official. Shut up, you can, right? Some platform, I had a swim platform on a boat now for four years and never lost the fish because it got in a swim platform. Right? If you lose a fish because you get your swim platform, you need to work on your netting skills. <laughs> or get a longer net. One of those two, right? I like this. I think I personally think that should be an option on every single boat. We're trying to get the guys at Polar Craft to make that an option. Actually make it a non-option on any of their fishing boats above 18 feet and make it an option on the others. No, it slides in. It's actually it actually it's actually comes in a four it's like four by four. It's a four by four tube that you mount underneath your gunnel. That ladder slides in. All the trains have it. Go to the boat show. Next time you're in a boat show, look at a train. A lot of the ones do. A lot of the bigger ones do. The one like my chat stuff. Yes. But all the trains have them. Even the bass boats. There's a little pin you pull out. The ladder comes out. Extends. Pop the steps up and there you go. And when you don't use it, it's out of the way. Make sure you've got a ladder that gets deep enough in the water. Now here's the other thing I will tell you about a ladder, right? Long enough to get in, to get onto when you're cold, wet, and tired. So that's what you're gonna be if something happens. You're gonna be cold, wet, and tired. And probably scared. Let's be honest. Right? You need it to recover anybody that goes overboard. Avoid ladders that put the person near the prop. That's a bad idea. And here's something you need to think about, guys. Again, test your system. You need a grab handle somewhere in the boat. 
You've been in the water for 25 minutes. You are tired. You're pooped. Okay? Stop. Stop. You're at the back of the transom. How are you going to get yourself in the boat? Put a grab handle either on the back, somewhere on the transom, on the back deck somewhere, or somewhere against the back wall so you can grab onto and get yourself in the boat. Okay? All right, kill switches. I'm gonna got a couple more things here and we'll take a little break. One of the things that, I, one of the places I think some of this blame needs to go is it needs to go on engine manufacturers. Okay? Because everybody except Mercury, and out of the major brands of outboards, Mercury is the only outboard I've never had, never owned in my life. Okay? The only one that gets the kill switch right is Mercury. Because their kill switch system is this. Okay? I want everybody to think about this. How many of you have a non Mercury engine with a kill switch? Okay? You hit a wave, you hit something, you make a sharp turn, you go over, your kill switch goes with you. How many of you can raise your hand and have an extra kill switch in your boat? Do you have an extra kill switch? You're in the boat, you're in the water. Your kill switch is attached to your life jacket. You hit a wave, you make a sharp turn, something happens, you go over. Person wants to come and rescue you. Click, 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 click. Because the only kill switch in your boat is where? On your vest. I've seen it. Not only do you need to have an extra one, it needs to be out. I would tell you, rig a little clip underneath your console, have your extra kill switch and an extra key there. Because you're going to be in the water with a busted arm going, there's a kill switch in the glove box. The guy's like, well, that's a kill switch. I don't, I don't. It's in the glove box. And you're watching the boat go that way. Because the only way to start your engine is where? Hanging from your hip. Mercury is the only one that gets it right. They use this system. Up, you fall out, it pulls it down. All you have to do to start the motor is click it back up to run and the person can start the engine without a kill switch. Everybody else is the switch either the kill switch either has to be in to pull the kill button out or it actually pushes the kill button in. Depending on which kind of motor you have. This is what I think happened to our driver. He had an oven roof, right? I think it came loose, wouldn't start. That should have turned some light bulbs on to some of you guys. I haven't got you yet. That should have got some yet. Jeff? When I have a partner in the boat with me, I don't put the lanyard to me for that reason. Okay, but you're driving along, right? You make a sharp turn to avoid something. You go out of the boat. Now that boat's going ring, ring. Yeah. Before he realizes it, right? <coughs> Your kill switch needs to be on. You need to have an extra one. Somewhere out that the person can see. And the person in the boat needs to know what to do if he needs to start that engine. Yes. My lung has two, one for the eight horse and one for the Right, so worst case you go out, guy can pull it off the kicker motor, right? But does everybody that you take fishing know that? No. Good man. Does that make sense? How many of you are prepared if you go over? And again, I want you to evaluate your rescue system, not can you save somebody, can the other person in the boat save you? Because if you have everything ready that someone who knows nothing can save you, I guarantee you've got a good enough plan to save them. Does that make sense? Have an extra key, have an extra lanyard. I got one of these last year, I'm going to put it in the boat. I didn't get a chance to put it in the boat, I'm going to put it in the boat this year. This is the Fell Man Overboard System. It actually works via Bluetooth. There's a bracelet, and this is ideal for someone like me, who's constantly, could you imagine Kill switch, as many times as I'm in the driver's seat and on the front trolling motor on the Detroit River, drive me nuts. Right? right? Okay. So what do you do? You sacrifice safety and don't hook your kill switch up. Right. 
This is a bracelet that you wear, like a watch. It interacts through Bluetooth with the kill switch, and if you get more than 50 feet away from the boat, it instantly kills the motor. So now I can be on the Detroit River, start my engine, because I've got the bracelet on, no kill switch, right? No lanyard. I run to the front of the boat, I fish, I go back, I sit down, I start the motor, I don't have to worry about this. Something happens, I go out of the boat, the minute I get more than 40, 50 feet away from the boat, engine kills. Then all my customer has to do is come back, press and hold, reset, you can start the motor back up and away it goes. That's a cool system. Batteries again though? Power to the Yes, those are I think C thirty twos, but they're the same ones that go, you know, those last. They're just those little round ones. You know, but again, I would probably change mine every every spring. So as soon as I can get my boat down to Duncan, I they were nice enough to send me one of those. I didn't get a chance to put it in last year, so I'm gonna put that in this year. That's an ideal solution to someone who's that's a that's a great bass fishing solution. Because one of the issues with the bass guys is every time I stop, I gotta take my lanyard off, if I believe my life jacket, I'm right up front, put the toy motor out, come back, click back up. No, you don't. Where's that mount? This just mounts in your dash. You can mount it underneath your dash, you can mount it, you know, you can do a hole in your dash and mount it. And it just connects. This transmits Bluetooth to and you can buy extra bracelets or there's a I think it's a five second push. Turns it back on. So is that taking place in your key? No, so I use the key. That's just the kill switch. Yes, it's not a keypad, just as the kill switch. Great question. Just a kill switch. Okay. Oh, there you go. Okay. So there's a there's a PLB. So there's no way if you do a little bit of finagle this winter, you should be able to get that hooked somewhere on your Blow up life jacket and tuck somewhere inside. It's going to be uncomfortable. Yeah, it's going to add a little bit of bulk, right? Or you strap it to your belt or strap. I don't care where you put it, but it's not too bulky. You shouldn't have it on your person all the time. That's not very. I mean, come on, really? You're attached to your cell phone. It weighs ounces. Yeah, it doesn't weigh anything. Yeah, it's it's pretty surprised how light it is. Thank you. Those batteries are ready to last like five years. Five years. Yeah. Okay. But this, this is a cool option, guys. So we'll talk more about that in a couple of weeks. Uh, you know, again, float plans, you already talked about that. I would tell you to fly your float plan, your float plan online. I'm, ugh, I, I'm very, very poor at this, but I think this is something we need to start doing more often, is in your vehicle. Put a float plan in your vehicle. I know everybody freaks out. I, I get it, right? Bad stuff is going to happen. Having a full plan is going to make it more likely to happen, right? I'm trying to work with the guys at Limited Beach Marina that there's a system that if guys want to report, right, that they can. That we, I'm trying to get them to put a board so you can come in and you know everybody gets a little plaque and you write your name and your boat and your MC number, all that information on there when you're coming back and you hang it up at Limited Beach Marina. When you come back, you Take it off. So all of a sudden it's three o'clock, it's four o'clock, it's five o'clock, and I got six placards hanging, and this one says I'm gonna be back by one, and there's a cell phone number. Somebody at the marina picks it up and goes, hey Jimmy, all right? Yeah, I'm gonna stay a little bit later. Can you change my comeback time till seven? There was an instance at Limit B, I don't know if you guys heard about this. It was four older guys, two younger guys. It was a guy, his brother, two kids. So it was a guy, uncle, and, and two kids. Boat went over, the old man drowned, one of the kids drowned. About four hours after they went under, one of the, old, one of the older guys washed up on shore and knocked on a door on the shore there by Lemon Beach and said, hey, we got a problem. They were able to save one of the kids. Okay, here's what pisses me off. They had a family function that afternoon. They were supposed to be back to that family function by three. Nobody from the family called until about 8.30. That's why you file a full plan with someone who is a pain in the butt. Okay, if that person would have filed a full plan at the marina or in his car, right? And the guys are going by that parking lot all the time, right? Check all the windshields. 
Okay, he's supposed to be back. Yeah, it's 5.30. He's supposed to be back at 1. There's a cell phone number. You all right? No answer. Right? Okay. File it online. Put something in your vehicle. Talk to the marina. Say, hey, I'm going. And this is what I do. The first thing I do when I get back in Saginaw Bay is I run out. Tell everybody I'm back in. Or tell one of my other charter captain buddies. Right? I'm back in. I'm back in. I'm back in. And when it's 1 o'clock and we're supposed to be back and it's 3 o'clock and I don't see Jason Gallagher tied up in a slip, five slips down from me, guess what I do? Call Jason. You all right? Yeah, I'm okay. I'm going to stay out. Okay. Lynn, would if you're a seasonal um, launch pass holder, their, their season tags go on the trailer and they have your phone number if that trailer's in a parking lot overnight? They, yeah. They just... Right? And then, you know, leave it with, with your friends. I just, that's just important, guys. Don't ever go fishing, number one, by yourself. Number two, don't ever go fishing without letting somebody else know you're going. And when you plan to be back. Okay? Have an emergency plan, right? These stickers are easy to get. I think I got a stack of these still in my office. Um, make your own stickers. Man overboard procedures, wear the safety equipment. You know, we have to label everything on our boats. You ever been on my charter boat? You see the red tags, right? You know, adult life jackets, um, uh, child life jackets, water light, water strobe, all that stuff is labeled. You should do that too. I went to A Frame Awards here in Flint. You know, Ben Rose has been around forever and he made me, I think, seven tags. I have all my stuff. I think that those seven tags cost me less than $50. I've gone from boat to boat to boat. And then it gets two screw holes, and you just screw them in where everything's at. Because I have to, as a charter cabin, label everything anchor, rope, sea anchor, water light, life jackets, all that has to be all that has to be labeled. You should have that label too. Just so somebody knows. Right? Basic first aid procedures. This is very important. Boat operation. And this is a, a, a hint that I took from Duncan that I think is absolutely critical. I love this idea. Every single one of his units, every single page in the exact same place has your actual location. So I guarantee you, over the course of the last couple of years, when GPS got popular, people have put a cursor up, called the Coast Guard and said, here's where I am, that's the only position on the screen, and that cursor is 10 miles from where they are. You need to have your position up all the time on every single page. So now when you go in, Joe Blow has only been on the boat for the first time, you say, see this box? And I don't know if you guys know this, but you can change these boxes, right? So you can do white letters on a black background. You can do a white square. You can do all that cool stuff. You can put a bezel around everything, make it look different. You can say, hey, if anything happens, that's the number you tell the Coast Guard right there. No matter what else is on the screen, that's the number you tell the Coast Guard. That's where we are. I, I took that tip, and this winter I've taken a, a note, and I said location and cursor. There, there you go. Different places. Yep. That's, that's critical. Have your physical location up there. Okay, all right, let's go wrap up with this. Do you have a plan for a man overboard or another emergency? Right? Do you actually have a plan? Right? Do you relay it to your guests? Does everybody that gets in your boat know? Do they understand? Do they get it, right? Is it written down? Because everybody's in the doctor, yeah, I got it, I got it, I got it. And you're gonna go in, they're gonna go, I don't know what he said. Right? Is your safety equipment immediately accessible? Make sure your compartments are unlocked. Make sure, yeah. see, I don't know when you think you need to say that, but yeah, right? Yes, yes! Is your safety equipment immediately accessible? Somebody goes over, can you grab an anchor right now and stop your boat? Can you throw that guy instantly a foldable cushion? <coughs> Not getting a friend digging around, can you get him safety equipment right now? Right now. More importantly, can someone who's never been on your boat before get it to you? That's what I need you to think when you access your plan, right? Have you tried your emergency plan? Got yeah, a group of guys in your boat all the time, right? Cushion. Man overboard. 
Okay? What's the first thing that, if you got multiple people in your boat, the first thing the first person does that sees that guy in the water? What's his job? Watch him. His job is to point at that guy and never stop. He never looks, he never turns his head, he never does anything but keep his eye on that guy and his finger pointed at him. I got him, 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 I got him. It's his only job. Only job. If it's just the two of you, your job is to get him something right away. And your job is to figure out how to get help before you start to help. Hey guys, this summer, especially with people that you fish with a lot, try this. Right? You're trucking along, just take your cushion out of the blue and throw it over, man overboard. Right? What are you going to do with fishing lines? Do you have a way to instantly go through? Through? Can anybody, can anybody in the boat start and drive your boat, right? Do they, do they know how? Do they have an extra key? Do they have an extra kill switch, right? Can anybody in that boat start your boat, drive your boat? Again, test your plan, not can you save someone else's life? Can the other people in the boat, do they have the ability to save yours? Evaluate your plan that way. If it's a yes, your plan is good. If the guy's in your boat for the first time, a half hour into the first trip he's ever been on a boat, if you have a plan set that he can save you, you have a good plan. If not, you need to work on your plan. Okay, let's get settled in and we can kind of get rolling. A couple things real quick that kind of came up uh, over the course of the break. On your table is a brochure from uh, Bob Llewellyn of Worldwide Reinsurance. Um, I will make this very, very simple. If you are not insured by Bob, you need to take that pamphlet. Jeff's got more. Jeff, you got more? Okay. Jeff's got more. If you're not insured by Bob, what you need to do in the next two weeks before we get thinking about going on the water is you need to grab your current watercraft policy and you need to call Bob. And what Bob will do is say, what do you have? What do you do? And he will tell you, yep, perfect. You're covered. Don't worry about it. Or, hey, make sure you add this. Um, and he will, I promise you, he will go over it with you give you the pros and cons of what you have, some things that you should add or maybe do better, and he will never ever call you again. If you would like to use his services and have him insure you, you can call him back and be more than happy to write your insurance. But he will, for free, on his own time, evaluate your boat insurance and tell you if it's good, bad, or different. It's just the way Bob is, and he'll never ever call you again. Yep. Yeah, we have progressive, and he said, look, he says, I can't beat what you have. He says, you're good. Yep. And he is honest about it. But now you know you have the right coverage. Yeah, right. Right? And the funny thing is when you hear, and we'll maybe get him back here for a little thing uh, sometime this year. Um, it's funny to hear, you know, when, when you talk to him, how many anglers hit the water every day that are not covered for anything that happens on the Great Lakes. And the Great Lakes and Connecting Waterways includes Lake St. Clair, the St. Clair River, the Detroit River, the Saginaw River. Um, if you're not covered, if you don't have Great Lakes coverage, and I guarantee you if you have your policy to the same guy that writes your homeowners, you probably are not covered for activity on the Great Lakes. Most of you are not covered for loss of equipment in your boat to an extent that will ever cover anything. Most of you are on a depreciation schedule. And after the third or fourth year, you lose a, somebody steals your boat that you paid 60 grand for, Jason Kelly's buying a new boat, right? Paid 60, 65 grand for it, three or four years, you don't have the right coverage, you're going to get a check for 2200 and be happy if you don't have the right coverage. If you're not covered by Bob, call Bob. If you are covered by Bob, call Bob. Say, hey, just making sure I'm covered. Okay, tell him what you do, be honest, what you do, what you have, where you fish, and he will be more than happy. He won't, won't cost you a penny to spend a half hour with him and go over your policy. That's what he does. He wants you to be insured. Okay, Jason? Somebody's learned that lesson the hard way from telling his money well to mention. I had a marina drop my boat on a concrete off the trailer. Really? 
end up making the marine advisor boat because there's no insurance company that got involved. Wow. Mine kind of just went, sorry, I can't help you. Right. And you got to be careful because you know you got to figure out what kind of losses are covered. If any of you do any kind of tournament fishing, uh, I guarantee you, if you're not covered or thought about it, you're not covered, right? So just call Bob. If you need another brochure? Jeff's got more in the back. Bob's a little rough, so when you call him, yeah. <laughs> Bob's Bob. Bob will tell you straight up. Might use a few four-letter words, but. Uh, <laughs> He'll, he'll definitely he'll definitely tell you how it is. I mean, you no know, you know, guess what Bob's trying to tell you. Uh, that's just the way he is. But you gotta love him for what he is and what he does, and he does a lot for this sport. Um, not only is he you know good insurance guy, but he does a ton for this sport that a lot of people don't see. He does a ton for the young kids get involved in this sport. He's got a heart of gold. I'm really glad he's associated with what we do. Call Bob, tell him you're a Walleye 101 member, and say, hey, I just need to talk to you about my insurance. Okay? So I'll get a hold of him. Um, Dean asked me the question about MMSI numbers with your boat. Um, an MMSI number is basically an identification number that gives the Coast Guard information about your marine radio. And an MMSI number is, is specifically tied to a radio. Okay, speaking of which, I found all my MMSI number the other day cleaning up my file cabinets. So I need to get it to you. Uh, I sold my boat to Forrest. All the MMSI information goes with the boat. So he just needs to change the owner, okay? So with the MMI, you can get an MMSI number for free. Uh, you can go to boatus.com, click on MMSI, I think it's MMSI registration. Uh, you can get an MMSI number for free. And what they will ask you is, you know, color your boat, size your boat, make your boat, model your boat, registration number of your boat, all the information about your boat, all the information about you, uh, insurance information, emergency contact information, and what happens is if you are in trouble and you use your DSC automatic distress call to the Coast Guard, if you have an MMSI number, it transmits all of that data through your radio and the Coast Guard knows exactly what they're looking for, MC numbers, color of the boat, knows everything, knows who to contact. So all that information is attached to your MMSI number. But tell them, make sure they got to have the radio hooked up to the GPS. You have to have the radio hooked up to the GPS. Yeah. They'll, they'll get the signal from the distress, but they won't have your GPS location. Correct. Yeah, the DSC will send your data, but it will not send your position if it's not hooked up to the GPS. Um, we have guys talk to us about radios. We, we sell a you know, dozen or so radios every year. Um, we really make a point to push guys to uh, the Lawrence Link 8 especially they have Lawrence Electronics, because to hook the two up, it's a very, very simple, it's just an extra add-on to your NEMA network. Is it the NEMA 2000? It's a NEMA 2000. It's an extra T and a plug in the back of your radio, you're done. MC numbers on your boat. Okay, this is a good time to bring this up, right? Coast Guard law says they must be a minimum of three inches high, they must be block characteristic, they must be single color. They must be a contrasting color to your boat. And they must be put on your boat, MC space, you can either use a dash or a space the same width as a letter. Number, 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 space, letter, letter, space, registration sticker. Let me say that again. MC space number, 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 space, letter, letter, space, registration sticker. So on the bow of your boat, from the nose to the stern, it's going to read MC number, 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 number letter, letter, registration. On the starboard side of the boat, it's going to start in the middle of the boat and read towards the bow, it'll be MC number, 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 space, letter, letter, space, Sticker. So your sticker will be towards the bow on the starboard side of the boat and towards the middle of the boat on the port side. Always reads right to left. Always reads left to right. Left to right. <laughs> <laughs> the, ja the Japanese boats are right to left. Ours are left to right. Left to right. I make those if anybody needs them. If you need new numbers, Greg will take care. There you go. Thank you. All right. So 
I know everybody, you know, we, we always run across some people who have two-tone letters, right? They went to the Marine and got these really nice cursive letters, and they got the, oh my gosh, they got their two-tone, they match the thing on my boat, wrong. Number one, you can get a ticket for that. It's the number one thing that the, the guys in Ohio write non-compliance warnings for. There's bad numbers, okay? I want you to stop and think for a minute. Yes, they look cool. They look awesome. Yay, they're color coordinated, they look great. Problem is, it's seven o'clock at night, you're not back in, Coast Guard's trying to look for you. And you've got blue and silver numbers on the side of a blue boat because they look cool. Okay? Can't find you. Can't see your numbers. At least three inches high, block characteristic, single color, contrasting to the boat. Stop with the fancy looking letters. It's, it's a bad idea. Okay? The other thing you gotta watch, it's not so bad on, on aluminum boats, on glass boats it's really bad because you'll get, especially some of the new boats, you'll get that little flare and guys will put their numbers up underneath here. Those numbers either need to come down below the flare or ideally up on the side of the gunnel where they're actually completely visible. Numbers aren't a cool thing, they're not an artistic expression. They're for someone to be able to find you and identify your vessel. Make sure that people that are looking for your vessel can see your numbers. I think that I think that would be my first test to you guys when you go home, right, or the next time you get your boat, or you're thinking about what you're doing. Can you immediately get to throw cushion, anchor, sea anchor, right? Can you immediately flares? Can you immediately get to those four things right now? Are they accessible right now? Not in a compartment, not in a bag, right? Can you get them, right? And again, it's not you trying to save somebody, guys. Can somebody in your boat who knows nothing about it save you? Paul? Yes? Is there a subscription The personal location, big good question. Is there a subscription? There is not. It simply transmits the position and says we got a problem. So there's no monthly subscription. There's no. What's that? I'm selling right now for two forty. I think they cost me like two thirty eight. Um, regular retailing is right around three ninety nine, somewhere in that range. I've seen them from two ninety nine to three forty nine, three ninety nine. Depending on which ones they are. Um, that Rescue Link Plus is probably one of the better ones that I've seen. ACR is kind of the leader in that, and we've got them on the website at two forty. It cost me. 238 with freight to get to me. So we're selling them at 240. So they want you to they want you to register so they have your information with that unit serial. So it must transmit a serial number. Okay, every three years. So Larry Larry's got his right here. It's got a barcode on the back. It's got a registration serial number, and it says every three years, right? So if it's deployed, according to Larry, if it's deployed and it's actually a real emergency. They'll send you a new one, yes. brand new one, for nothing. Yes. So I think that's that's awesome. I mean, what a great company, right? I was gonna say, what if, uh, what about putting one of them uh, solar blankets in case somebody goes? Yeah, great, great, great point, Pete. You know, I, yes, I would tell you if you're making a list of stuff to put in the boat, yes. grab a couple. Of, you, know, you can buy those little foldable solar blankets for about three bucks, yep. right? Throw a couple of those in the boat. Uh, you know, somebody get in the boat and you know go in. You know, something to just get them warm, right? Great, great point, Pete. You think the comment about the lock, unlike your lockers, but my anchors and the bow, starboard side, the back to the compartment, my anchor with the rope. In front of that is the sea anchor with attachment. Right. How often do I get in that compartment? Yeah, you never get there, right? I unlock all my compartments when I get the whole school something. How many people would not unlock it because they never get in Right, there? yeah. Yeah, if you got your storage stuff, if you got your safety stuff somewhere, make sure. I didn't think about that because I never lock anything. So uh, I didn't even think about unlocking because I don't ever, I don't ever lock my compartments. So now you can ask steal my stuff because I told you to unlock it. Right? Um, that's different. That's different.
for a different. Person. I don't ever lie because what happens? I, I'm gonna show up at the I'm gonna show up at the, the lake one day and I have my key over my compartment. Not be able to fit, so I just figure it's just easier that way. Just all, um, just all my kill stuff. <laughs> so, but yeah, great point. You know, open all that stuff up, right? Make sure it's make sure it's there. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm really I'm not joking about this. I don't think you know tags or labels are a bad idea. So I went to a, a trophy shop and they just engraved on a piece of red plastic and they, they screw right in. I screw them right into the deck, right into the floor, and they're right on top of the compartment. And it says anchor and sea rope, you know, sea anchor, and it's just it's just easy. And I made them red because you know red is the emergency color, right? So they're red and the white shows through, and away you go. Well, that's a good thing. I knew where all that stuff is. Correct. You wouldn't know where it is if I go in. Again. If you get nothing out of tonight, when you go home to evaluate your plan, your plan needs to be based not can you save someone in your boat, can that person in the boat save you? Okay, we always work to the lowest common denominator, right? So can that person who's been in your boat for the first time for a half hour, if something happens, can that person save you? That's where your plan needs to be. I Pete asked me, Pete asked me the same question. Uh, I have a generic template that I use for man overboard and radio call that I have to have as a charter captain. That I made just a generic template that you then customize with your MC numbers and you know where I actually it actually says on mine where the location is if you need to make a call. You know upper left hand corner use those numbers right. I, I let me find that template. I know it's somewhere in my computer. Uh, let me find it. And I will post it. And it's just a basic, just a basic template I have to have to meet Coast Guard requirements. So I, yeah, great. P. S. Yeah, great idea. Yeah, I will. I'll try to find my template and, and get it going. All right. So the United States Coast Guard has an app. Uh, review safety equipment. Request safety check. File a float plan. Uh, report a hazard. Emergency assistance on the bottom. That's emergency okay. Assistance right there. Okay, so emergency assistance, you hit the thing and it says call the U.S. Coast Guard or call 911 and it has your current location. Right. And that's under U.S. Coast Guard in your apps, under your Google Store. So there you go. So, in the, so there you go. So that's something we maybe we'll come across and maybe talk about on a Facebook Live thing. We'll run up a few apps and, and do it. Danny? Hey, Lance, um, you talked earlier about the guy not. Being in a panic situation, not possibly look this down. And guys are just drawing on the Saginaw Bay. They called, I don't know if any of you guys heard the story or not, but their buddy, they figured he went in around 9.30 in the morning. Their buddy received a cell, uh, voicemail at like 2.30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he went in, he called his buddy, and his buddy didn't check his voicemail until... Or, or the cell didn't, the cell towers didn't send it. Is that Either way. Works? That happens to me. But his first call should have been the 911. Correct. Yeah, if, you, if, you're, yeah, if you're in a bad situation, guys, don't call a friend. Right? Don't phone a friend. Right? <laughs> call, call 911, right? And I, I would tell you, however your phone does it, you know, have them on your speed dial. Right? If, it, if, it's, if it's something, you know, I know on my Android, I can place, um, I can place people on my you know, home screen, or if I just push and hold that, will automatically call that number, right? So have something that immediately says 911. You don't want to have to dial 911. Have, if you can push it with one button and get it done, get it done, right? One thing, as a first responder, the one thing I would tell you is anybody that's got any first responder training, even when you know where everything is in the boat, repetition, practice, this is something you can do sitting in your boat in the garage, because you may discover when you open the hatch, they get in that anchor out, that's the where the compartment isn't as big as you thought it was. Correct. Right. And then you have to fight to get it out. You can sit in your garage, how quick can I get this out? You may find that just rearranging some things makes it a lot quicker, makes it a lot more fluid. And repetition, practice, it's, it's pounded into every first responder. I love that we got two, two first responders here. I think that's, that's awesome, right? And I think they would both agree that in a panic situation, if you can buy yourself 30 seconds to think, things go a whole lot better than just jumping in and, you know, I, I think sometimes panic sits in and our first reaction is just to react. And I think sometimes, especially these guys who are trained, I imagine you're probably trained to sit back and assess, even, 
It's amazing how long 15 seconds is. When you just step back and go, okay, what is really going on? Why is my motor not starting? Oh, kill switch is off. Boom. Guy saved. Right? Or, yeah, or it might not have been a neutral. Great point, Mikey. Yeah, he, he, yeah, it might, exactly, right? So I think just buying yourself, having something available that eases your mind and just buys you 30 seconds to think makes that situation go from really bad to salvageable. And all we're trying to do is make a good decision. And you can't always make a good decision when you're in the middle of panic. I think that's that. I think that's something we need. And practice is huge, right? I mean, anything you do, the more you do it, the more it becomes. So I said, next time you're out this summer, especially if you've got your normal crew, two or three guys you fish with, grab a buoy, throw a man overboard. What do we do? Right? What do we do? Looks your follower. Exactly. <laughs> everybody's here. <laughs> On the break, and this is something that I just, when we did our water safety rescue, I work for the state police, and one of the things we do is an extensive water safety program. I've been in the ice tank, we've been in the pool with our clothes on, all of these things. So, But the, big, the easiest thing, the simplest thing, quickest thing, have a cushion that doesn't have to have anything tied to it, on your seat, that you can throw it to them. Once you know that they're going to stay above water, that gives you those few seconds now. We are always taught, throw the first thing, get them something to keep them above water, Toe, throw them something you can pull them back with, you know, roll or turn the motor on, go back, but just throw them something that keep them above water. Simplest, quickest, easiest way to ensure that you have a little bit more time. So. I agree. That's a great point. I mean, just buy yourself a couple seconds to think, right? We're all better when we have a, you know, we all know what to do, I think. We've all pretty much at least have an idea of what's a good thing to do. Do we have enough time to get it into our brain and right because panic is bad i mean panic is panic is bad yeah tunnel vision right yeah all you do is i gotta get back to the guy well no you don't you just need to especially when you know he's okay right if you can get something to him and know or he's got a light jacket on right wouldn't you feel a whole lot better if someone went in and all of a sudden you saw their light jacket inflate doesn't that take a little bit of pressure off you as opposed to somebody going in with a light jacket right so it just kind of all works together. Paul, those little procedures, right? The motor won't start. One, two, three, four, five, right? Right down the list, right? Is that, it points that because I think panic not only ruins your mind, it ruins, it does, I'm sure it does ruin some of your motor skills, right? You kind of start to freeze up, right? Everybody's you've been in a situation where I, I don't know what to do. I think the easier it is to get things. Right? Things can't be under compartment, move two boxes, lift a shelf, get my anchor. That, that, that can't happen. That, that can't be your procedure. That cannot be your procedure because that's not going to work under pressure. It's not going to work under pressure. It has to be simple. It has to be easy. The things you need, right? I'm sure when Dan pulls up out of an accident and has to take care of somebody, he doesn't have to open up his box and dig through and go, well, where's the first thing I need? I'm sure all this stuff is laid out, so the stuff he does need is at the top, right? And all your important, here's the problem, we do that with our fishing stuff. So typically we go out, my anchor's not hooked up, I mean, it's in the compartment, it's not hooked up. I mean, it needs to be hooked up to your chain and your rope. Have it Absolutely. Yeah. So you gotta Just gotta throw it over. Yeah. And when I, I, I take my rope, I co I coil my rope so it's not gonna be tangled. It's in the storage compartment, right between my two consoles. And it's right on top. I coil my rope, and then on top of that goes my chain and my anchor. So all I have to do is grab that anchor, throw it overboard. As it's going, it's on coil, and it's just still in the storage compartment. It's just I can get that fast to get my anchor out. I'm ready to go. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Don't have to attach anything. You want it ready to roll. Because I, I I've seen times where guys had to use an anchor to stop a boat for whatever reason, linkage breaks. Some, you know, you may have to use that anchor to do something other than just yeah. anchor. Okay. I got it. Right. Be ready. Jim. My dad put me out of the tip of, of putting the tag end of the rope in the bottom of the bucket and just, just put, put the rope on top and it, it goes out pretty free yep. rather than 
Yep. Have all the stuff placed to collect. Yep. Having a bucket, you know, having a, you know, five gallon buckets for the weight and gold in the boat. You can do a lot of things with a five gallon bucket. It becomes a sea anchor, you know, it becomes a portable toilet, right? It becomes a wash bucket, it becomes a bailing bucket, you know, it becomes a lot of things, right? Um, it becomes anchor storage, you know, it, they're, they're worth their weight in gold. If you had a place to put them, that's the problem. This guy won't take up the space, right, for an anchor. Um, another thing I would tell you before we go is this. A um, couple things to think about. Obviously, think about your plan. Um, I would like to see some input on the members only Facebook page. Maybe about some things you need to change. Maybe some things you have right. Maybe some things that you know your plan is good or it's not. Uh, let's let's kind of keep this conversation you know fluid and going and everybody being involved. I think that's important. The other thing I would tell you is we've talked about safety. We've talked about this type of stuff. I would strongly encourage you to do a real serious thorough rundown of your boat. Do you have an extra bilge pump? Right? If you have cartridge pumps, which everybody should have, if you do not have cartridge pumps in your boat, right now is the time to change them. If you have to physically take a pump out to change a motor, that's a bad idea. You need cartridge pumps. So basically the housing goes in, it's got a, uh, a container or a cup, and the motor just goes in and locks in. If the motor goes bad, you take the motor out, the housing stays in, you put a new motor inside the housing. You don't have to completely unscrew a housing to, I can't imagine there's too many boats anymore that even don't do that. But make sure that that is the case, right? If you don't have those, change those. Other thing I would tell you is make sure your wiring is extremely simple to get to, change, and to identify. Okay, I have four different pumps in the back of my boat. I have, two, I have a front and a rear live well, and I have two bilge pumps. Each one across the set of wires, down at the pump, up at the connection, because Polarcraft uses those real good, high quality um, uh, automotive connectors. Just unplug and plug right in. And my extra pumps have that other connector already on it. So it's simply put it in, plug it in, go. I don't have to cut wires and try to crimp. Because you can't do that. In your, I dare you to get in your compartment in two foot waves and your bilge pump goes out and crimp new wires on. You can't do it. Right? You can buy a Molex plug kit for 15 bucks and make your own plugs and away you go. But each of my pumps at the wire on both sides of the connector, male side, female side, and at the pump, each one of my four pumps has a different colored zip tie on. So I know that pump is bad, I pulled out the purple zip tie, I know that I need to find the purple zip tie up here where my wires are. So I'm not going, which one of these is this connected to? Because I guarantee you, every one of you that hasn't done this work, you have a glob of wires in the back and you can't figure out which pump goes where. Cut that big glob apart, pull your wires out, identify them somehow, so you can match up what goes where. Now when you have a problem, you simply put a new cartridge pump in, you know that the purple pump just came out, you need to plug into the purple switch, away you go. Okay, you can buy those little packages of colored zip ties, they come like eight or nine colors, just put a little different color zip tie on every wire that's the same. Now purple goes to purple and red goes to red and yellow goes to yellow, it's easy. Extremely easy. You get down there, because those compartments aren't easy to get into, right? They're not easy to see in. Ranger does it right. They, they, they do their pumps the best of anybody. They actually have a spot on the floor that comes up forward of the back bulkhead. So the back deck where all your live on stuff is forward of that on the floor is a piece that comes out and all four of your pumps are right there. That's the, that's the best, yeah, that's the best way to do it. You know, I gotta get in there and kind of go, you know, like that. So, I can't even reach my Yeah, we're working on that at Polar Crash. One of the things we're working on is fixing that. But make sure that you're, you know, a lot of guys don't carry an extra pump, number one, which is silly. Number two, they just have it there and they gotta, now they gotta get in there, ghost pump goes out. You got a little leak. See, something happens, right? You got some water coming in. All of a sudden your bilge pump doesn't work. 
You gotta get in your compartment and get out a bilge pump. Then you gotta find your cutters and your crimpers and your connections. And now as your water's boat's filling with water in two foot waves, you're trying to get your hands down here in a spot you came and do off the water on your trailer very well. You're trying to cut, put wires in, and recrimp. Sound like a good idea? Sounds like a problem, right? Take a little bit of time, get that stuff ready to go. Right? You can buy those male female plug sets for a couple bucks. Right? And have them ready to go and have one ready to go for your extra pump. My look at look at your wiring. Right? Do you know if you blow a fuse on your bilge, your auto bilge? Do you know where that fuse is? Do you know which fuse that is? Do you know what size it is? Do you know where to fix it? Right? Build yourself a wiring diagram. The beauty of having Duncan do my boat is everything is labeled and I have a little map and it's just beautiful. Beautiful. Right? It's just nice. I know what everything is. Do you, right? You know, other thing, real quick. Do you have the right tools to fix anything in your boat? What's that? In the garage. That helps. That's awesome. Right? So I have a I have a toolkit in my boat that is a ratchet, a couple of extensions, right? And I have the only thing I have in my boat are the size sockets that I need for everything in the boat. I don't carry everything. I don't need everything. Right? You should never ever use wing nuts on your batteries. Should always be nylon nuts. Okay? How many of you have ability to get a nylon nut off when you're in the water? Try to do it with a pair of fishing pliers, like most guys do. <laughs> right? Or you do a little bit of welding. It's always fun to see arc welding in the boat. It's always a fun thing to do. Right? So make sure you've got the right tools to fix anything that could go wrong in your boat. You see, it seems so simple, right? But guys don't, I mean, how many guys do we help down the marina, Billy? We don't have the right Tools to get you, got to take a battery out. Okay, well let's take the, I don't have any. So everything you should, you may have to fix, you should have the tool in the boat to do it. Second thing, that's where I was going, Mikey. Have a bilge pump with alligator clips on it. A jump box. A little bit bigger than this one, 65. Absolutely. Charge your cell phone. So jump 20 dead cars. Yep, those little Wegos. Yep. That was the glove yep. charged up. Yep. You know, I carry I, I carry an extra bilge pump with the alligator clips. The other thing I carry is I carry now I use it for other purposes too, but I carry one of those water guns that the you know you use at the beach. Yeah, yeah. Because now I can stick that sucker all the way down the bilge, pull it, shoot the water out. Right? It's a whole lot better than trying to stick a bucket down there. And then if something gets too close to my spot, I just stack them side of the head with some water, right? It's kind of, kind of an offensive weapon and a defensive weapon, both. All right, anything else? All right, good man. Um, you know, again, it wasn't an exciting, sexy subject. Um, I hope everybody got something out of it. Um, we've got six weeks before we hit the water. Um, it's time to spend some time going through your boat going through your emergency procedure. Can I fix what needs to be fixed in a hurry? Do I have the right tools? Do I have procedures in place that I can keep everybody on the boat safe? Okay, end of February guys, all the way to the end of February, anything that we have on our website, we have the inflatable life jackets, the e the uh, PLBs, rearm kits, uh, lights, whistles, all that stuff. Uh, all the way through the end of February, that stuff on the website. There's a, if you go to the store and go to the side, there's a safety link to take you right to the page. Uh, all that stuff is at my cost until the end of February. And just so everybody knows, this has kind of got lost in the shuffle. There's also a $5 donation option if you want to uh, donate to the gentleman that passed away, Nick Kaler. Uh, as you order, there's a $5 donation there uh, for his family. Uh, and at the end of February, I've committed to match those donations up to $1,000. So whatever, whatever our guys decide to donate, I will match that dollar for dollar up to 1000 So um, a little something that we can do to, it doesn't make a difference, I don't think, um, but just something we can do as a group to say, you know, we don't want this to happen again.
Uh, I'd rather have you do it through there so I can keep track of it. So there's a donation item on there, it's $5. You want to donate 20, just buy four of those. They'll charge you 20 bucks, no tax, no nothing. And, um, that way I can keep track of it. So at the end of the February, I can just get that number and I can match it and send them a check. So, um, you know, it's just, for some reason, for some reason, this cause is kind of gnawed at me since it happened. It bothered me the, the, day, the minute I saw it, that the guy was gone, and it's bothered me ever since. Um, I'm working on a couple articles that I will, I'm going to send an open letter to all the organizations that run tournaments to the National Professional Language Association. This has got to stop. This stuff has got to stop. Sending guys out in weather. Chad, you ever been sent out in weather you probably shouldn't have went out in? Okay. Sending guys in weather they shouldn't go in needs to stop. Anger's not being able to say, no, I'm not going, needs to stop. Selling boats without taking people to the lake needs to stop. Allowing somebody to buy a boat over 50 horsepower without a water safety class needs to stop. A safety package that consists of four crappy orange life jackets, a 10 pound anchor, and a paddle needs to stop. Kill switches that can't be activated right away by somebody in the boat needs to stop. It just needs to stop. We finally lost somebody. I've been saying it for 20 years. You talk, we've been saying it. Someone's going to die. Someone's going to die. Somebody did. And here's the worst part. Not a single person gives a shit. I guarantee there's nobody else talking about it. FLW ain't talking about it. BASS ain't talking about it. Because it takes money out of their pocket. Bravado and greed. Somebody has to start saying it needs to stop. And I'm going to say it needs to stop.